Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni moni wanji, namaste, jumbo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you are joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, Good Pods, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Suchi Siram. She'll be here to celebrate Dancing Deepa. Before we invite Suchi into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Skipper, Friend, or Foe, a distracting mystery within life's traumatic events. Middle grade novel written by Kelly Sanchez. As an educator and mom, Kelly Sanchez put her 20 years of experience working with kids into writing Skipper, Friend, or Foe. It's a coming-of-age mystery novel for teens and tweens. Skipper is really uh, a great book for guys to read. It uniquely explores a boy's emotional viewpoint. This would be a great addition to your family library and can start some really important conversations with your tweens and teens. Get your copy today. Skipper, Friend or Foe, A Distracting Mystery Within Life's Traumatic Events by Kelly Sanchez. It's a Reading With Your Kids certified great read. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Riley the Retriever Wants a New Job, written by Jill Mengo Weisfeld. Riley the Retriever Wants a New Job is a delightful and witty book about a dog named Riley who is trying to find a more meaningful job than just being a retriever. Riley begins her quest by researching working dog jobs on Google to see if she can find one that is better suited for her. The book's colorful artwork brings Riley's adorable personality to life. The book is entertaining, educational, and suspenseful. Young readers will love learning about a variety of working dog jobs, and they're not going to wait. They really aren't going to be able to wait until the end of the book to find out which job Riley finally chooses. It's a wonderful, wonderful book that you and your kids will love. Riley the Retriever Wants a New Job by Jill Mangel Weisfeld. Join us right now from beautiful St. Paul in the state of Minnesota. Our guest is here today to celebrate her picture book. It's called Dancing Deepa. Please welcome to the show, Suchi Sairam. Hey, Suchi, how are you? I'm very, very well, Jed. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be here with you. I'm delighted to have you on. You are, in addition to being children's author, you're a dancer. You are a, a really elite dancer, am I right? I uh, I don't know about elite, but I've been at it for a very, very long time, and it's um uh, it's a passion. It's a, a dance form called Bharatanatyam, which is from originally from South India, and but now practiced uh, throughout every corner of the world, throughout the diaspora, and um and keeps evolving. So it's very, very beautiful to be a part of that. Awesome. Well, since dancing Deepa is based on dance in a lot of ways. Can you talk a little bit about that style of dance and where we may have seen it? Sure. Um, so, so it's uh, it's roots are really in the temples of South India in a state called Tamil Nadu. Um, you may have heard of the city of Chennai. Uh, so it's in that state, and uh, really originated in in the temples as a a an integral part of temple worship. Um, but over centuries and centuries and centuries, it keeps evolving. And over the last 200 years has um, evolved from just being in the temples to also being in courts and then uh, eventually to the proscenium stage. And uh, there were a lot of arts patrons that were uh, their royal patrons for a very, very long time. And then as, as things kept evolving, um, uh, the the people that were exposed to this kept changing, and now the practitioners. It used to be only females that practiced it for for centuries and centuries, um, and now there are uh, people of of all races, all genders that practice this beautiful art form throughout the world. 
Wonderful. I, India is is a fascinating place to me. I've uh, have connections with with India. Uh, uh, one of the members of our team has been working with me for six or seven years, and she is in Mumbai. And I sponsored a couple of of students um, from India. One from Kerala, who is now. Uh, an, an ordained Catholic priest who is doing amazing things and was awarded the Jewel of India. I'm so proud of him. And so I Incredible. I have these connections, and we've had many, many authors on and, and a couple of Bollywood stars on the podcast. And it, it's such a diverse place. We always, you know, growing up, I, you know, the United States was celebrated as the melting pot, and it's the only place in the world where there's so many different cultures and ethnicities are living together and then i see a place like india with 28 official languages i think and maybe a hundred others that are spoken throughout and all sorts of ethnicities and i'm like going i that people exaggerated the united states a little bit back when i was a kid <laughs> no, i think it's just different i think mm -hmm. it's just a different reference point um there is incredible diversity in 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 both mm -hmm. and i think the uh the thing about the diversity in India is that, like you said, there's there's language, there's regional language and culture and customs, uh, food influences and influences from from different times in history, and uh, and so things evolve and and evolved in different ways, and so there are certain commonalities and certain things that are that are completely completely different. Um, it happens to be a country called India, but it's actually up in you know not so long ago was was a collection of districts and a collection of um uh, some some that were ru ruled by royal families and and so these things have evolved over a period of time but a lot of changes in the last um you know 50 100 150 years mm -hmm. and so i think it's a um in some ways calling it a country it's like calling it's like saying europe has commonality there mm -hmm. are some commonalities uh, but it's a collection of countries. Mm -hmm. And even within those, of course, we know the level of diversity, mm -hmm. even just from, from Northern to Southern Europe. So I think it's, uh, just a different, a different flavor of diversity, yeah, um, yeah. that's yeah. across India. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a long time before the EU is going to be considered one country. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably never. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. So tell us, um, about Dancing Deepa. Yeah. So, so Dancing Deepa, actually, I, um, I had zero intention of, if you asked me this question at the beginning of December 2021, if I was going to write a book, I would have said, oh, are you kidding? You know, I had zero plan of writing a book, um, wasn't even on my radar, certainly wasn't on my bucket list. And uh, just before the holidays, it was a conversation with one of my adult students um, who has a now four-year-old daughter. It's time she was three and a half. And my student was just just talking about the fact that there was there was a a genre of literature missing where she just didn't have stories to read to her daughter that were about our art forms, that things that she could connect with. Most of the books about our art forms are historical mm -hmm. or they're translations of really, really big texts or they're research texts, things like that. And very, very little fiction and certainly not child-friendly fiction. Mm -hmm. And so this was just turning over in my head over the holidays and, um, and then early January, I was thinking to myself, I said, you know what, why not me and why not now? Um, and so based on that, I just started doing a little bit of work on, okay, how do I go about this? Um, and what's the best path forward for me to do this? I was, I was motivated to write something, but I was particularly motivated to get it done quickly because this year happens to be the 20th anniversary of my uh, studio and company, Kalavandaram. And so I really wanted to to uh, do this mm -hmm. in 2022 here. So fast forward, um, then I was able to kind of get things going early February, had the, had the draft done. And then um, fast forward to early June and I was able to, to uh, share it with everybody. So it was a quick process, but um, I was fortunate to have a lot of very, very timely, helpful, helpful input uh, to help me make it ha happen. So, uh, so that's where, that was the genesis of it. Mm -hmm. And it was really motivated by, uh, sparked by this conversation with my adult, my adult student, Kirti, but really motivated by 
uh, my my own personal experience to a small degree, but uh, mostly the experience of my students. Mm -hmm. And I see them practicing a culturally specific art form. Um, How do they share it with their friends? How do they uh, do they do they feel comfortable sharing it with their peers in school, with people that they meet? Do they, you know, when I was growing up um, in the 70s and 80s in Texas, I really led a parallel life. I had my American life and I had my Indian life. And um, I see them, that evolving and changing for my for my students now, but um, we're still not there yet. And so my goal was to try and create something that would maybe facilitate that a little bit more to where kids could be their whole selves all mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. It's, it's interesting. I think I've mentioned on the show uh, – I grew up in an area that was mostly um, Irish Catholic. There was some Italians, but we also have a sprinkling of a number of different other ethnicities in in my school and in my friend circle. And I remember this one friend in particular. He his family is from Latvia, and when I would go over his house, I would hear uh, him speak with his mother in the kitchen in this foreign language. And he would come back, and I and I would ask, "Hey, what's?" say some of those words and he wouldn't he was like he, he you know it, almost to the fo- to, to the point where he was like I, I don't know what you're talking about i only speak english my mother only speaks english and and uh and i was very sincere in my interest you know i wasn't asking him so i could make fun of him um but i, I do kind of relate to what you're talking about when you were in texas as a girl you had your american life with your friends and in school and then you had your, your Indian friends and, you know, kids that you were going to the cultural school with are doing those, those cu- cultural things. Do you see, you said you do see that changing a bit. I, I feel that way. Yeah. Um, as a very, very simple example, uh, I, I ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for lunch for 13 years going to school because there was, I, there was no chance of me taking Indian food. I mean, mm-hmm. um, even even something that uh, wouldn't be considered, you know, the smell will be uh, disturbing to other people, anything like that. Um, even that small thing, you know, I, I see kids now, they're, they're taking uh, food from home and Indian food for, for lunch. And, even, I mean, that's a big deal. Mm-hmm. It seems like such a small thing, but it actually is a really big deal. A simple thing of um, uh, feeling free to wear more ethnic clothing. Mm-hmm. Um you know, wearing a wearing a, a kurta, which is kind of a, a a long tunic that would be typical of Indian clothing, over jeans. Um, even that's a shift. And these seem like small things, but you know, you don't have to keep your Indian wardrobe completely separate. There are culture days at school now, which, when they existed when I was growing up, they they really felt. Um, uh, you did. You worried if they were sincere, and so you didn't really want to put yourself out there. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think those things are shifting. We're still not we're still not there in the sense that um, each kid's experience is a little bit different. Partially depends on who they're around. A lot of it depends on the adults in their lives too. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, my hope is that dancing deepa is a is a way to initiate conversation, mm-hmm. and in some ways just to to give them a little view into how it could be mm-hmm. um, if you if you take a leap if you overcome that fear if you take a risk um and if you have some positive influences in your life too in your friends Mm -hmm. circle and uh adults in your life too yeah yeah i i I, we've we've celebrated here on the podcast since the beginning of of the show that the ability of books that the ability books have to be windows mirrors and sliding glass doors to give kids like like the woman who inspired your book give her a book where her kids could see themselves reflected in the pages of a book, but also give my kids an opportunity to get a peek into your life and in your culture. And hopefully that understanding would give opportunities for all of us to come together to build friendships and to, to learn how to respect each other and see each other as family. Absolutely. And, and, so as an example, your Latvian friend, um, even just that courage to, to answer your question, mm-hmm. your, your genuine question about, I'd like to learn, I'd like to hear a few words, mm-hmm. um, and not, not be worried that it would be turned into ridicule or anything mm-hmm. like that. 
Um, but along, along those lines, I think that's, that's one thing that has been such a delight for me through this entire process. You know, my, my students have been an integral part of this coming to life. And very early on, I read them drafts. And I'm, and when I say read them, I mean all of them. And, and this is all age groups from the youngest ones, teenagers, the adults. And every single age group had such important inputs into, um, into the, the way this, the, the text evolved. Mm-hmm. And the teenagers really talked a lot about the truth and what would the experience actually be and what would the realistic experience actually be? Because I didn't want it all to be rainbows and unicorns, mm-hmm. but I did want it to, to convey something positive, mm-hmm. but they really helped me shape that to make sure that it would be a realistic experience. Mm-hmm. And the, the younger students were so invested emotionally uh, in, in her story and how she reacted and how she felt. And, and without their inputs, I think it, it would have been missing some of these elements. So, I mean, their inputs were critical throughout. And so it was, it's been, it's been such a delight to see us all invested in it. I'm I'm wondering since you you don't have a writing background necessarily, you, you, you have a background as a dancer, which can be a very collaborative uh, art form. Uh, do you think that that helped? Because I know a lot of authors, and I know when I've written, um, you know, and you give it to an editor, and an editor says, oh, this is really good, now, but fix all of these problems in your text. I get really annoyed. My wife can tell you that. Um, <laughs> do you think because you had so much experience uh, collaborating in, in dance that that made – that process of getting input from your students um, a little bit easier for you, make make it easier for you to be open to those suggestions? I think uh, certainly contributes to it mm-hmm. uh, for, for sure. You know, in our, in our art form, in our, uh, well, I don't even call it just specifically our art form, but I would say in Indian arts, there is a, um, there is this, this uh, feeling and tradition of, you know, you, you put your hands, put yourself in the hands of your teacher mm-hmm. Um and they, they shape you and mold you and, and all of that. So I think in some ways that creates a mindset of you listen and you learn and you try to be a sponge and absorb all that's around you um, and absorb from, from people that know more than you. Mm-hmm. I think that that is an integral part of it. Uh, so, I, so I think that certainly is, is a part of that collaboration. I knew that they would have very, very valuable inputs. And so I wanted to hear them. I absolutely wanted to hear that. And I think the other part that, that helps me a lot with collaboration, I have in some ways I have a parallel life that's been in engineering and marketing and executive leadership and that you're, 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 it's better when your mouth is shut and your ears are open. Um, And in, in the sense that, in the sense that when you, when you listen and when you collaborate and when you listen, you don't have to take every single input that you get. I mean, it takes time and experience and you can't um, deviate from, from what your goal is, Mm -hmm. but at least listen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important um, lesson for me over these many years, both in business and in the arts that helped me with collaboration. Now you were mentioning that now, especially with your group, there are people from all different cultures uh, dancing with you and dancing your your traditional Indian style. Uh, any do you ever get any backlash from folks saying that oh these people from other cultures are appropriating our culture? I wouldn't say that. Uh, I think there's it's it's all over the the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, there's certainly some that do. There are some that are perhaps uh, not perhaps uh, certainly more sincere than people for, from whom are kind of born into that culture. Um, because when you are born into that culture, then at least some things just kind of come to you naturally. You just absorb them by osmosis. Uh, it's different degrees of that to me being born into an Indian family and South Indian family. Um, some of these things are familiar, but being raised and uh, living in the diaspora, some things are, are, are not Mm-hmm. by osmosis. I have to actively learn them. 
and take that to another another level. Somebody who is not from that background that commits themselves to this study, and it's a lifelong study. You can be study, you can be dancing for fifty years and still be learning. Mm-hmm. Um, they're learning culture, language. Every, I mean, every small gesture, you know, things that we take for granted. Um, so, so I think there is a level of commitment in many people that are not from an Indian background that is just astounding and phenomenal. And they make amazing artists. Um, and there's actually a very important discussion that is happening in the circle right now about appropriation from the traditional artists. So for centuries, this, this art form was cultivated within a certain, a certain caste, a certain group, uh, within, within South India. And then with part of the Renaissance that happened in the 20th century, it was, it was taken in many ways from them and their livelihood and their art was taken from them, appropriated from them. And so there's a lot of complex discussion about appropriation, um, uh, from, within mm-hmm. as well as from outside. Oh, fascinating. Fascinating. I, you know, uh, I, I love people. I love meeting people from, from all walks of life and all cultures. But the one thing that I've learned, the one thing we all have in common is people can really complicate things sometimes. No question about <laughs> it. No question about it. We are complex beings. We, we are, are complex beings for we sure. We are. We are. Hey, I, I, I'd be really curious to see some of your performances and I'm sure people listening. Is there a way for us to, to, to see you perform, see your, your company perform? Sure. There, uh, you know, on our YouTube channel, we actually have, uh, some, some clips of different performances. Some are, um, from individual students. Some are things that we've done as a group. Uh, so certainly on our YouTube channel and, and there are a lot of really, Fantastic artists that have posted videos on YouTube as well. But, uh, the Kalavandaram YouTube channel, I think it's youtube.com slash C slash Kalavandaram. Uh, could all also be reached through our website, kalavandaram.com okay. that, um, and people could see some videos there too. We'll be sure to put that link in the show notes. Uh, sure. I know uh, people are also going to want to know where they can go to find out more about dancing Deepa. Sure. Uh, so dancingdeepa.com is a great place to start and just has some links to different places where it's available. The usual suspects, um, starting with a, I always love to, uh, pitch for local independent bookstores and, um, uh, there as well as, uh, barnesandnoble.com, amazon.com, uh, the other places, other online marketplaces. So mm-hmm. it's available available there yeah yeah we always encourage folks uh if you want to su- support your local independent bookshop you can um just pick up the phone give them a call and say hey do you have dancing diva and there's a chance they don't and uh if you just ask but nicely, they can but they can get it yeah they can they can they can order it for you and they have access to that which mm-hmm. is wonderful yeah yeah i you know again before we say goodbye it's we just live in this amazing time where not only that we're able to experience different cultures, different times, we're living in a time where you can be inspired to write a book and in less than a year it's available around the world and we live in a time where we can support a giant company like Amazon or choose to support one of our neighbors in their um, in their small independent stores. It's just a beautiful time. It's astonishing, isn't it? It it's, is. Uh, to me, it, it's it is quite astonishing that 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 opportunity is there, yeah. um, and it it takes some elbow grease and some hard work, and like you were talking about earlier about collaboration, uh, a lot of inputs from people that um, that can help you, mm-hmm. and being willing willing to to take those inputs, but but it is possible, and we have so many wonderful choices in how to bring some of these things to reality. It's really, uh, really amazing and joyful. Yeah, it really is. Hey, um, just one last question. Now that Dancing Deepa is out there and it's obvious from your expression uh, that it, it was fun and you're really proud of the book, will there be more children's books coming from you? That is that is my plan. And uh, my, my most important thing was to make sure that, that – 
this was received positively and what has been so fulfilling for me is to see some, some the early reviews from from people who have grown up as Bharatanatyam dancers and saying, you know, this is the book that I've been waiting for. This is the book that I didn't know I was waiting for my entire life. And uh, I've had several of my students, you know, we've, we've turned, we've called them now dancing Deepa moments at school where they will talk about um, that they were willing to talk about their art or they were willing to perform in a talent show because, because of dancing Deepa. And so because of that, it, it's, it's, uh, okay, we've, we've got something beautiful here that can be built on. And what was, what was comical for me was the, my young, some of my youngest students, when I brought the, the copy in for them to physically see, um, after it had been printed, you know, their first question is, when's the next one? And are we going to be in it? <laughs> so. I'm guessing there has to be a next one and they have to be in it. So I've got to figure that out. (laughs) Well, we look forward to that coming out and we look forward to you coming back on the podcast. Many thanks so much for, uh, for having me. And it was such a, uh, such a delight to talk to you. We've had a great time speaking to the author of Dancing Deepa, Suchi Siram. Suchi, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much. Be well. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. It is a blast. Bob Shea, Brian One, they're going to be here to celebrate the Adorable series. It's a really, really fun episode. We had a couple of, of uh, I don't know what we're going to name the episode yet. We have a couple uh, a couple of suggestions uh, that came up during the conversation. Um I think a lot of dumb things all day long. That's one title suggestion. Uh, Dr. Seuss was a sadist uh, was another suggestion, and uh, I'm ready for brisket. Uh, You'll find out what we decided to name of the episode. Just keep your eyes open. That's the next episode of the podcast. Hey, if you're the author of a fantastic children's book, please visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the author's click here button at the top of the page to find out how we can help you celebrate your book with the world. You can be a guest here on the podcast. You can submit your book to our certified great read panel, and you can also take part in our monthly promotion program that will celebrate your book with commercials on the podcast, messages to our 99,000 plus social media followers, display your book on our nationwide network of digital pedestrian billboards, and display your book in any uh, at any live event that we're taking part of in that month. Learn about that and more by going to readingwithyourkids.com and clicking that author's click here button at the top of the page. Want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, want to start by thanking our guest, Suchi Saram. Please be sure to check out Dancing Deepa. Also want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Nicole Bell Castro, Ashley Contouris, Mirabella Q, Rain Penn. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.